right. Well, greetings um, and welcome to another Orbis webinar, another neuro-ophthalmology webinar. Uh, this is Dr. Carl Golnick uh, coming to you from uh, my home at Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, United States. Uh, it's uh, about um, uh, 10 a.m. my time here. Um, welcome. And uh, there is a Q&A box that you probably all will see either at the top or bottom of your screen please feel free to write questions in there as we go through the course of the webinar. I am going to wait till the end of the webinar to answer the questions. So um, if you have questions, don't, don't, maybe don't write them right now because I may answer them during the webinar, but um, feel free to start writing questions. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about three different topics today. So dysthyroid optic neuropathy, third nerve palsies and neurovascular imaging. So sort of a, a potpourri of, of topics, but I think it's more interesting to cover a few topics than one long and boring topic. So we're going to start with my objectives. When we're done, I'm hoping that you will be able to describe the approach to thyroid optic neuropathy. You'll be able to describe the management of isolated third nerve palsy in adults. That's what we're specifically going to look at. And then you'll be able to describe some new neurovascular imaging techniques uh, that, are, that are fairly new, and I mean in the last couple few years kind of ballpark. I have no financial conflicts with anything that we're about to discuss. So here's a patient we'll start with. Um, she, uh, the question I read here, does she have a dysthyroid optic neuropathy? Um, this is a 48 year old woman who has swelling around both eyes, very obviously. She has blurry vision for the last couple of months. She was recently also diagnosed as being hyperthyroid. Um, she is 2020, however, on exam. Her visual fields are full to confrontation and she has uh, limited motility in all directions. Her fundus appearance is normal. And so I'm gonna skip ahead to the next slide. So the question is, and this is an audience response question, I'm just trying to get a feel for what people think. Does this patient have dysthyroid optic neuropathy? Yes, no, or I need more information. So we will let you vote. You can click on the box um, uh, that you uh, believe is the, is the correct answer. And then we will discuss, the, uh, discuss your responses. And we're going to give you, I don't know, 20 seconds or something like that. I can't really see. Oh, there we go. I can see some of the responses coming in now. Um, oh, is this, I think the post, I'm already sharing the poll results. So it looks like the voting is done. Sorry. So about two thirds of people would like some more information. About a quarter think yes, and, and about 10% or so say no. And so we're, we're going to answer that question in the course of the next few slides. But I think the answer, the, the brief answer is three. We, we need more information. We don't have enough yet to determine whether there is a thyroid optic neuropathy. Clearly, she has thyroid active thyroid eye disease, but we don't know enough yet to know if she has optic nerve dysfunction. And so this is um, information and data from a paper published a couple of years ago, um, about five to 8%, depending on what you read of thyroid eye patients develop dysthyroid optic neuropathy. They're, they typically are male and older, but certainly you can be young, a young female and have uh, an optic neuropathy, but the statistics show that it's more likely if you're male and older to develop this. So when I see a patient with the new onset of thyroid eye disease, I usually talk about the spectrum of eye disease with optic neuropathy being sort of the, the most severe stage. And I tell them, you know, at most maybe one in 20 or so people will develop thyroid optic neuropathy. Uh, uh, just if you look at all comers with thyroid eye disease, interestingly, and I think importantly, um, half to 70%. So at least half the patients have pretty good central visual acuity. So 2020 to 2040, 66 to 612. So you, you can still have an optic neuropathy and not, not still, at least half the people can have an optic neuropathy, but have pretty good central visual acuity. So the fact that the visual acuity is good does not mean the nerve's working okay. And about 70%, it's bilateral, but of course it can be unilateral. And my residents sometimes ask me, well, wait a minute, this is a systemic disease. Why would someone have a unilateral problem? And the answer is, it happens. I get the same sort of questions about myasthenia. Why would myasthenia be unilateral when it's a systemic disease? I don't know, but it can be. And then 
The fundoscopy only helps you, of course, if it's abnormal, but at most 50% of patients will have, ab have abnormal fundoscopy. So clearly you can have a normal fundus, a normal optic nerve, and still have a compressive optic thyroid optic neuropathy. You can see, of course, in both of these fundus photos, there's significant swelling of the, in this case, the right nerve. Uh, there's a um, little hemorrhage right here off the top of the disc. In the other eye, you can see, again, moderate swelling of the nerve. You can also, I think, better appreciate in this uh, fundus photo, these linear uh, ridges or lines. These are radial chorioretinal folds. So there's something pushing on the back of the eye. In this case, in thyroid eye disease, big extraocular muscles can cause these uh, radial retinal choroidal folds. So don't forget to look for them. Another way to look for these is using your uh, red free. So your direct ophthalmoscopes with the green filter. Sometimes these will pop out better. I've got some examples I don't think I'm showing here. So keep in mind these characteristics when we talk about what do we need to know, whether there's a um, dysthyroid optic neuropathy, or DON, D-O-N. So of course, whenever we talk about optic nerve disease, we're interested in whether there's a relative afferent pupillary defect. But remember, we just said that about 70% of people, it's bilateral, and certainly in some percentage of those, it can be symmetric. And of course, if you have a symmetric optic neuropathy, there will be no relative afferent pupillary defects. Although obviously, it's very helpful if an RAPD is present, that means that there's got to be optic nerve dysfunction or some big retinal problem, but you can rule that out pretty quickly by looking at the retina. There's got to be a, a, a optic nerve problem if there is a relative afferent pupillary defect. But the lack of a relative afferent pupillary defect does not mean you're good and the patient doesn't have a problem with their nerves. If it's symmetric, there will be no relative afferent pupillary defect. And thyroid eye disease tends to be symmetric. Color vision can be very helpful, uh, usually people with any sort of optic nerve problem that affects central vision, remember that's key, affects central vision, usually their color vision will be down, almost always. So color vision testing can be very helpful. And you may have someone with very good vision, 6'6 six, six or 20-20, who may not see the color plates very well, and that's a hint that there is something going on with the nerve. But remember, like the APD, if the color vision is normal, and the visual acuity is normal, you could still have an optic neuropathy if there's peripheral loss of vision. Okay, so color vision is helpful, but if it's normal, that doesn't mean, again, there's no optic nerve problem. Ocular motility, it's usually going to be very abnormal in thyroid optic neuropathy. So I can't even, I'm not sure I've ever seen a patient who had normal ocular motility, normal ocular motility and thyroid optic neuropathy. Because why do you get the thyroid optic neuropathy? You get big extraocular muscles that usually are compressing in the orbital apex. We'll show some examples in a moment. And so usually you're, clear, you're going to see significant ophthalmoplegia prior to developing dysthyroid optic neuropathy. In visual fields, I said in the patient prior that the visual fields were normal to confrontation, but confrontational visual fields are a very gross testing mechanism. So here's the most common type of field defect that's, that's reported with thyroid eye disease. It's inferior field loss. I don't know why, um, but it is. It's most of the patients I see have either constriction of the field, central loss, but most common pattern I see is inferior field loss. Why? I don't know why. It's just more common inferior. And you can imagine that in this patient's visual field, centrally, they look pretty good. So their central acuity is good. Their color vision is good, but they definitely have optic nerve dysfunction uh, as evidenced by the visual field test. And of course, CT and or MRI, I think CT scan is perfectly fine for thyroid orbitopathy. If you're sure someone has a thyroid eye disease, it's cheaper. It's usually faster to get a CT. You can even get a non-contrast CT pretty quickly, um, easier for everybody, cheaper and so on. So. Typically, I will order a CT in the setting of what looks to be known thyroid eye disease. And you can see, of course, in this sort of mid-orbital cut, the enlarged muscles. And again, uh, for reasons we don't know, uh, or at least I don't know, it's inferior rectus most common, then medial rectus, then superior, and then lateral. So it's just that's the way you expect the muscles to be enlarged. 
you'd be very suspicious if you saw just a big lateral rectus muscle. You'd want to think about other diagnostic entities. And it, you can imagine that back in the orbital apex, and I don't think I've got that picture yet, in the orbital apex, if those muscles are all big, then that optic nerve is going to get squished because there's bone 360 degrees in the back, in the, uh, around the orbit and around the nerve. So these are the things that you want to think about when you're, when you're really looking for dysthyroid optic neuropathy. Is there an APD? Is the color vision normal? How about the motility? You're probably not going to see an, a dysthyroid optic neuropathy with good eye movements. Are the visual fields, automated visual fields normal or not? And then does a CT or an MRI show uh, compression of the optic nerve in the orbital apex? I show this not for you to quickly write this down, although you, you certainly can if you want. I thought it was kind of, um, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, uh, funny. Uh, this is a, a publication from just a couple years ago where they looked at these at a way to predict whether there'll be a dysthyroid optic neuropathy. And they came up with this formula, which interestingly you can see contains the things that sort of we just talked about. That, is there a relative afferent pupillary defect? What about motility? What about the mean deviation, MD, on the automated visual fields? And then what about color vision? So here's the way they, they fill in this formula. Is there an APD, yes or no? Uh, the combined limitation of ductions, the mean deviation of the field, and then the percent of color plates correctly identified. And they said, basically, if you plug all that information into this handy formula, if, the, if Y is less than zero, it's not dysthyroid optic neuropathy. If it's greater than zero, it is. So I, I, I do not use this formula. I show it just because what it points out to you is what I tried to just point out in the previous slide. What's important when we look at whether or not there's a dysthyroid optic neuropathy, APD, motility, visual fields, mean deviation, and color vision. Those are the important things. Have I ever used this formula? No. Will I ever use it? No. All right, so let's go back um, to this patient. And the question now, I'm gonna ask the same exact question for those who, who we answered it, you have another chance. So now the question is, we know I'm, I've given you a little bit of extra information, um, and that is that there is no APD, the acuity is normal, the fields are full to confrontation, but the automated perimetry is abnormal, inferiorly in both eyes. And the motility is significantly limited in all directions but the fundus is normal. So now what do you think? Is there, uh, does this patient have dysthyroid optic neuropathy? Uh, yes, no, or do you still need more information other than uh, the, uh, the extra information, which is the fields are no abnormal, uh, symmetrically, inferiorly, and there's, uh, there's significant ophthalmoplegia. And all right, so very good. So now that we've reversed things a little bit here, so 68% are now saying, yes, there is. And so, and the answer is yes, there is. You, they've, she, the patient has abnormal automated perimetry in both eyes inferiorly. It's relatively symmetric. So there's no relative afferent pupillary defect. And it doesn't involve central vision, which we know is common in dysthyroid optic neuropathy. But the combination of the abnormal visual fields, that's enough for me to say, okay, she has uh, a bilateral symmetric optic neuropathy. Now, certainly I would expect her imaging, which I don't talk about, to show orbital uh, crowding in the orbital apex from enlarged extraocular muscles. Okay, I'm gonna move on. And so that's of course what we've been talking about. And here's a good, a nice uh, axial CT scan. And you can see here the medial and lateral recti. And you can easily, whoops, sorry, easily understand um, how this optic nerve loses because you've got bone here, bone here, bone 360 degrees, but you've got too much tissue in the back of the orbital apex on both sides, harder to see over here. But this person indeed has the kind of CT scan I would expect to see uh, with orbital apical compression in thyroid eye disease. Now, I think, and, and we think that this, the pathophysiology is compression of the nerve or the blood supply in the orbital apex in almost all the patients. But I have seen an occasional, not occasional, a rare patient who has no orbital apical compression, but has, as you can see, this nerve is just stretched out. So if there's a lot of fat in the orbit, which there is here, and this orbit is tight, they've got big muscles, 
you, I think there is such a thing as a stretch optic neuropathy. I think it's pretty rare, but I think I've seen it a few times in 30 years. So rare. Usually it's compression of the nerve in the orbital apex. So how would you treat this patient? This is another audience response question. The same patient we just talked about. She's got a bilateral optic neuropathy. Um, how do you treat her with observation? And we can go ahead and, and ask the audience this one if we've got the, yeah. So would it be observation, oral corticosteroids, intravenous pulse corticosteroids, orbital decompression, or radiation? And we'll, we'll of course, we'll be talking about the various forms of treatment um, after I, I just, I'm curious to see what people say about the answers to this question. And we're getting some votes, I'm assuming. I can't see the votes as they're tallied here, but let's see what the audience says. Okay, so we have a, a, a variety. So about half the people say intravenous pulse corticosteroids, about a third say oral corticosteroids, and then um, Small percentage decompression, very small percent observation and radiation. So, all right, well, let's see what, what we're gonna do. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what I would do yet, but um, so here's what at least what the UGOGO, the European Group on Graves Orbitopathy would recommend as first line treatment for dysthyroid optic neuropathy, not just thyroid eye disease. You know they have optic nerve uh, compression at this point. And they recommend pulse IV methylprednisolone. Uh, you can see the dose, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. Sorry, that's supposed to stay for three days. It doesn't. There should be a three there. That's a typo I missed. And then if there's improvement after that short a period of time, weekly pulses of IV methylprednisolone uh, for at least the next six weeks, once a week for six weeks. However, if there's not fairly rapid improvement, then orbital decompression. So if there's no, no or very poor response in the first couple of weeks, go for decompression. So this is a, a, a sort of a consensus statement from four years ago now, from 2016. And this consensus statement is based on a bunch of, of, of previous publications, of course. Most of these are all retrospective. You can see um, one was a randomized controlled trial, but there were only 15 patients in it. But most were all, almost all retrospective data. And these are all the um, treatment trials for uh, uh, dysthyroid optic neuropathy that they use to help form this consensus. What about since 2016? So there've been a couple of, I think, interesting studies, although they've been retrospective. This one was interesting. Uh, in 85 patients, they all received the UGOGO recommendation, which was the 500 to 1,000 milligrams per day for three days, followed by the oral steroid, uh, an oral steroid taper, um, and then they repeated it if it was no better. So they got the three days, no better, they repeated again, three days, and then, if no better, orbital decompression with an oral steroid taper. And their results, I thought, were fairly impressive. 60 of the 85, whatever percent that works out, you know, more than two thirds, improved and did not go on to need decompression surgery. I thought that was, that was to me, was pretty impressive. Um, my feeling about steroids had been that um, they, they, they certainly can help, but you know, once you get rid of the steroids, the problem usually comes back. So I was impressed. Um, so about two thirds didn't require surgery. Of the, of the 25 who did need surgery, 24 of the 25 improved. So saying that the risk of, of waiting a couple weeks was, very, was relatively small. And they followed these people for about a year and a half. So there seemed to be a lasting effect of the pulse steroids. And of course, about a third did need surgery. And then this paper, which is from 2018 as well, also a retrospective paper looking at radiation and steroids. Now, the key thing here, remember, these patients, they had 104 patients with 163 orbits. These were all patients that were corticosteroid responsive. These were not just patients with any old dysthyroid optic neuropathy. To get in this study where they were going to give radiation, you had to show that you were responsive to, radi to, th to steroids, but the steroids did not hold you. So in those patients, they gave 2,000 centigrade in 10 fractions, so 200 centigrade per fraction, and steroids, and 98 out of 104, I mean, almost everybody did not go on to require surgery. And so uh, this is further evidence that radiation for optic neuropathy in the setting of thyroid may be very helpful. It's not, we think, that helpful for mild to moderate 
thyroid eye disease, but in rate in um, optic neuropathy, perhaps helpful. So in summary for dysthyroid optic neuropathy, um, we look for these things, our APD, color vision fields, disc appearance, CT, MRI. We look for these to try to help us diagnose whether or not there's an optic neuropathy. Keeping in mind that a visual acuity and confrontation fields are not enough. We need visual uh, automated perimetry at least, and of course, hopefully checking for color vision and the other things we've mentioned. We then start, if there is, the first line treatment in my, my feeling is the intravenous pulse steroids. Um, there is debate existing regarding the best treatment at this point, and we certainly need a randomized controlled trial um, to try to figure out what is the absolute best. But really all we have now are the retrospective type studies that I've described. I just wanted to say one more word about thyroid eye disease in general. Now, this is not specific to thyroid uh, optic neuropathy in any way. In fact, you wouldn't use this as a first-line treatment, but you might use this to prevent thyroid optic neuropathy, and that is this new medicine that was approved in the United States just back at the end of January 2020. Tepeza, it's called. It's teprotumumab, um, and it's, as I say, approved um, in January in the U.S. It's an insulin-like growth factor one inhibitor. And it, it's infusions, so there's an initial infusion, and then there are seven additional infusions over the next 21 weeks, or well, 24 weeks, I guess, total. So there's one infusion, then three weeks later, the seven start. Now, I'm gonna show you some data as to how, how effective this is. One of the problems with this medicine is, at least in the United States, it's $15,000 per vial, and you probably, unless you're very, very uh, light uh, in terms of body weight, you're gonna need two vials per treatment. So do the math, that's $30,000 a treatment, uh, except for the initial treatment, so it's expensive. This is just some of the adverse reactions that were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, not really anything too terrible, I don't think, uh, as compared to placebo, certainly some of the things are a little more common. But this is the data that led to fairly rapid FDA approval. Um, this is uh, proptosis response. So the placebo group, the teprotumumab. This is the change in proptosis in millimeters. You can see huge differences in these curves. Clinical activity scores improved in tepro with the, with the drug, overall response, double vision response even, and change from baseline quality of living scores much better for tepro tumumab. And they showed some uh, pictures like this from the article, which just showed impressive improvement. So this is baseline, and then after the 24 weeks of treatment, I mean, almost back to normal, um, remarkable, I think. So this is out there, at least in the US, it's approved, it's very expensive. Uh, we are having some trouble getting it approved by insurance companies, but I've had a few patients who are in the midst of this treatment right now. Okay, that's what I have to say about that. We didn't really talk about just run-of-the-mill thyroid eye disease that much. Um, I think the teprotumumab is, is definitely, a, could be a major uh, game changer. It may mean a lot less optic neuropathy. It may mean a lot less um, double vision and strabismus surgery, we'll see. So I'm gonna move on to the next topic, um, which is management of acute isolated third nerve palsy in adults. And I wanna make sure that we understand here, acute, so sudden, not, it's been going on for six months. Acute, isolated, and adults. I'm not talking about kids, I'm not talking about chronic third nerve palsies, I'm not talking about third nerve palsies with other findings, and we'll talk about some of those things. So here's a patient, and uh, let me just turn that sound off. And you can see this is an older gentleman um, in his set late 70s. Uh, you can see that he has significant ptosis, he has a right third nerve palsy with uh, almost no um, elevation, depression, or reduction of the eye. You can see that his pupils are about the same size and very small. They both react okay. Um, and his history, both the histories of these patients are that uh, his the lids drooped over two days in each patient. There's a mild ache around the right eye. Um, I'm sorry. There's a mild ache around the right eye in this patient. There's a mild ache around the left eye in the patient below. So I think I'm going to show you the next video. This should be mild ache around the left eye. There are no symptoms of giant cell arteritis, GCA, in either patient. 
the patient below is in his 50s, the patient above is in his 70s. Um, otherwise, it's the fairly acute onset, and you can see the eye movements in the patient below. The only difference is the patient below has some ache around the left eye, and you can see the pupils. It's tough to see, but the patient below, left, eye, left pupil is bigger than the right pupil. Um, so the question for the audience is, is the management of these patients the same? Yes or no? Is the management the same? Meet management meaning, what are you gonna do? All right, let's see, uh, what does the audience say? Um, so uh, the, the majority certainly say no, and then the minority say yeah, so good. All right, well, let's see. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about management of third nerve palsies here. That's what this is about, we'll, we'll decide. Um, so third nerve palsy, incidence, etiology, uh, in one population-based study, in the United States anyway, um, there were 4.2 patients out of 100,000 when you look at population base. And of course, uh, well, maybe not of course, but not surprisingly, third nerve palsies are more common if you're over 60 years of age than if you're under 60 years of age. Um, in this study of, uh, with 145 cases, um, presumed microvascular were almost half, about 10% had tumors, 10% were surgical, 6% were aneurysms. Interestingly, of the aneurysms, five of the eight were aneurysms of the cavernous sinus, which are a little bit different than posterior communicating artery aneurysms because cavernous sinus aneurysms don't kill you. If they rupture, you have a cavernous sinus fistula. And then there are some less common things like giant cellulitis, stroke, et cetera, et cetera, that I've listed at the, bo listed at the bottom here. So certainly a wide variety of things. But Presumed microvascular, by far the most common of these, all of these various etiologies. And remember, when I say acute, and that's what this talk is about, I mean less than one month. They come in and say, yep, I've had double vision for less than a month. And isolated, which means no other neurologic symptoms or signs. Pain's okay. I, I, that, I, people can have pain or discomfort with a microvascular third um, or with aneurysm or other causes, but no other signs. So, this assumes one has looked for the other signs, and sometimes the signs are more subtle than others. So let's look, and this, don't, don't, this will be a question for you, not yet though. Let's watch this video. And the question is, does this fellow have an isolated third nerve palsy? So we're looking first at his right eye movements. I always tell my residents, don't forget the eye that looks okay. Look at the other eye, make sure the eye movements look normal. So here's the person looking up, down, left, and right. You can see that clearly there's a, 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 a significant left third nerve palsy. The question is, is this, is this isolated? Is there anything else going on when you look at this video? So what do you think? Yes, this is an isolated left third, or no, this is not an isolated. And I'm not sure we gave you enough time to see, but I know that pole is covering his left, <laughs> his left eye. Um, but let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. We're going to look at the answer in a moment. So go ahead. Okay, so about half, well, not half, 60, 40. Okay, so let's remove the poll. Let me just, so the answer is, look at his left eye when he looks for, tries to look from up to down. We'll wait for the video here, or maybe I'll hurry the video along. So when he looks from up to down, look at these blood vessels. They don't move. Watch it, we'll show it again in a moment at the end of the video. Up down. There is no intorsion when he looks from up to down. If the fourth nerve is working, you will see an intorsive movement of that eye. And you'll see those conjunctival blood vessels intort. They'll move downward. But you don't see that. So in the setting of a complete third nerve palsy, the only way you can really look for fourth nerve function is to have the patient try to look up and then down and look for intorsion of those blood vessels medially there, nasally. So this is not isolated. So this would not fit in our category of acute isolated third nerve. This person had a metastasis to his cavernous sinus. And, and hold on, let me again. get rid of the... And right again. Now this fellow, of course, was complaining of double vision and that was all he was complaining of. Well, of course, then his lid shut. But when I was checking him and holding his lids open like this, he said, you know, it's funny. I, I can't, your, your, your thumb on my right eyelid feels different. It's kind of numb. And I said, oh, you can't feel that very well. No, it's up, up that side of my forehead. 
So the question is, is this an isolated third nerve palsy? Let's have a, he's got a big pupil, you can see that. And it doesn't work well. And he's got a, looks like a pretty complete third. Let me see if I can, sh uh, I don't know if I have him look up and down. Watch those vessels. Yes, there's intorsion. Let's, let's just, so here's an example of the fourth nerve working. Let's just go to the end. And when he looks from up to down, right, hold on. Right now, watch those blood vessels. There they go, in tort. Okay, so let's ask the question, is this isolated? Okay, voting is, this one should theoretically be easy. Oh, okay, well, the, uh, we can close the poll. So uh, what I, when I told you that he said, hey, I can't feel your, your finger on my eyelid very well, he's telling you, this is not an isolated third nerve palsy. Your third nerve does not innervate sensory, uh, the, the skin on your forehead, right? Or your lid, your fifth nerve does. So this person has a decreased sensation in the right V1. This is not an isolated third nerve palsy. This is a right third and V1 division. This is someone who had squamous cell cancer that was removed about five years prior, they thought successfully. And that, that squamous cell cancer crawled back down the fifth nerve and got the third nerve in the cavernous sinus. This is not isolated. This is not the people that we're talking about in this talk. So like I said, if we're talking about the differential diagnosis of an acute isolated third, you want to make sure you check the other cranial nerves. If the fourth nerve or the fifth nerve or the sixth nerve are not working, it's not an isolated third nerve palsy. And the recommendation is different. Okay, so what about the management? Well, lots of different things could be potentially relevant. And all of these things have been discussed and uh, uh, just at, at every me big meeting, neuro meeting you're gonna go to, there's gonna be something probably on third nerve palsies because the aneurysms can kill you. So there's the, the age. Well, if you're greater than 50 or less than 50, is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because certainly it'd be very unlikely to have a microvascular third if you're less than 50. Um, so it's relevant, sure. Um, can you have an aneurysm and be greater than 50? Sure. Um, pain, yes or no? Well, that helps me almost not at all because the vast majority of third, diabetic third nerve palsies I see, there's pain. It's ipsilateral. I see pain with microvascular thirds and fourths and sixths. It's usually not terrible. Certainly if the person's got severe pain, they're gonna get image, but the presence of pain does not help me at all. Uh, giant cell arteritis symptoms. Well, in the US at least, depending on, depending on where you live in the world, we, we have a, you know, enough giant cell arteritis that we're gonna at least ask the patient if they're over 50, we're gonna ask them about giant cell arteritis symptoms. That does not mean I'm gonna get a sedimentation rate the C-reactive protein in the CBC on every patient with a third nerve palsy, but if they have any symptoms of giant cell, I'm going to get those blood tests. I will document in my chart, I thought about giant cell arteritis, they have none of the other symptoms, I'm not pursuing that. What about their past medical history? Well, certainly if there's a history of cancer, there's a saying that I, I frequently use, which is, there, is there, if there is a history of cancer, it's the cancer until you've proven otherwise. So if they have a history of cancer, I got to rule out cancer. Do they have vascular risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia? Remember, you don't have to have diabetes to have a microvascular third nerve palsy or fourth nerve or sixth nerve. Uh, you don't have to have diabetes. Is it complete? Well, is the third nerve complete? So is the eyelid shut? Does the, uh, is there no elevation, depression, or adduction, as I showed in several cases? Or is it partial, like I showed in the very beginning in the fellow with the, the lower of the two videos who had a mild third nerve palsy? Uh, is this the initial evaluation? When, when in the course of this third nerve palsy are we seeing the patient? Is it day one? Is it, because certainly a, a, a microvascular third nerve palsy, if you see it uh, the day after it starts and it's partial, it can definitely get complete over the next week. And I warn people, listen, this could definitely get worse. Your lid could shut over the next one or two weeks. But if I see them three weeks out and it's partial, it's probably not gonna get worse if it's microvascular. So if it does, then I'm more worried. Is there pupil involvement? So we talk a lot, you hear a lot about, is there pupil sparing? Well, 
if you have a complete third nerve palsy and the pupil looks perfectly fine, then you can say, aha, there is pupil sparing. But what if it's partial? Maybe the aneurysm isn't quite pushing on that pupil yet, but it's, are the pupil fibers, it's pushing on the other fibers. My point here is that there's a lot of things that go in to your decision-making process, at least in the past. But I'm gonna make it very simple for you. But the, all of those things are potentially relevant. So I don't think there's much controversy about age less than 50. If the patient's less than 50, you're almost always going to image. I don't think that's controversial. What about if there's the patient's greater than 50 and they have diabetes and high blood pressure? Is that controversial? Well, there've been a number of studies that have looked at that. So here's one from uh, oh, 15, 16 years ago. Age greater than 50, acute isolated third nerve palsy. They, this patient reported 29 patients, eight had complete third nerve palsies with pupil sparing. All of these were microvascular. So that's kind of reassuring. In this paper, they looked at 100, uh, sorry, 14 patients, and this is from 2011, 14 patients with third, third nerve palsies, complete with pupil sparing, all were microvascular. And this patient, this paper was a little bit different. So they had 22 third nerve palsies, four were complete with pupil sparing, and one of them complete with pupil sparing, um, there was pituitary apoplexy, which is a, a, a potentially deadly condition if it's not diagnosed. Their conclusion was, hey, maybe we should image everybody with third nerve palsies. And what about the imaging? Well, um, this paper, the first one I'm quoting here, says that M you're certainly going to want to get uh, some sort of blood vessel imaging, right? I mean, that's what we're worried about. We're worried about the aneurysm. That's what's probably going to kill you fastest uh, if you have one that's not diagnosed. So when you order imaging, clearly you want an A, MRA. An MRI is not enough. A CAT scan is not enough. So you either want an MRI, MRA, or CT, CTA. So when I say slightly less sensitive, I'm, I'm referring to as compared to a CTA. I think this depends probably at least a bit or maybe a lot on where you are and what your institution has. Some institutes have great CTA, some have great MRA, some have both. So, so it may depend on availability. Um, I think I would talk to the neuroradiologist, hopefully that you have in your department or your institution and find out what's, what's, what do they think is their best way to detect small aneurysms or big aneurysms. The second paper I'm quoting here is, is basically they said, gee, you know, it matters way more that you have a neuroradiologist than whether you can do a CTA or an MRA because the neuroradiologist is needed. And I know there are a lot of places in the world that don't have neuroradiologists and barely have radiologists. So that's is an issue, but clearly you want to have a good neuroradiologist if you can. And then another issue that comes up is, well, what if the CTA or an MRA is normal, but you have a really high suspicion. It's a young person with no vascular risk factors with a partial pupil involving third nerve palsy. You've done your CTA or you've done your MRA. And the, the basic um, thinking is then get cerebral angiogram to look for the small aneurysm that might be missed on an MRA or a CTA. Now, if you ask me, okay, when's the last time I had to order an angiogram because we missed a small aneurysm on CTA or MRA? I can't remember. It's been more than a decade because we usually find them. Nevertheless, the treatment, the, the uh, recommendation is if you're really concerned, or let's say you don't have, you're not real confident in your CTA, MRA, or neuroradiologist, then a cerebral angiogram is indicated. So I've got two slides and this sort of, it's a little bit of a, uh, not sure the right way, way to say this, but here's what I teach. If the patient's greater than 50 and they've got a third nerve palsy, consider giant cell arteritis if giant cell arteritis exists where you live. Ask the right questions. That doesn't mean I get the blood tests on everybody, but if they have any symptoms of giant cell, I get the blood tests. If there's an acute isolated third nerve palsy at any age, with any risk factors, with pupil sparing or pupil involvement, get an MRI, MRA, or this, the CT, CTA. Everybody. Why? You're going to get MRI, A's, and CTAs on people with microvascular thirds. But how many third nerve palsies do you see in a year if you're not a neuro-ophthalmologist? Will you remember all these little caveats 
And then there's always that occasional patient with an aneurysm with a pupil sparing third. Are you willing to take that risk? Just get the imaging. Don't worry about pupil sparing, age of patient, just image them with MRI, MRA, or CTA. And if it's normal and you have a really high suspicion, get the cerebral angiogram. Now, what do I do? I, it's not what I do. So I do the same as what I just said. If the patient's less than 50, if there's cancer, if there's no vascular risk factors, if there's pupil involvement, if it's incomplete, no matter the age, I get, I get it. However, I don't image if they're greater than 50, if they have vascular risk factors, if there's complete and it's pupil sparing, unless there's no improvement in six weeks. So I see lots of third nerve palsies. I think most neuro-ophthalmologists do. Um, if I see you know, a 75-year-old diabetic hypertensive with a sudden onset of a third nerve palsy with pupil sparing and it's complete, I, will, I, will, I don't image them. What do I recommend for a comprehensive ophthalmologist? Image everybody. Why don't I do it? I see lots of third nerve palsies. Uh, in the United States, at least, healthcare spending is not sustainable. We need to do what we can do to limit spending. Um, in my experience, I looked at my the last, I don't know, 20 years, 430 um, of those third nerve palsies, um, of the 430, more, well more than half were microvascular. Um, if I got an imaging on everyone, you can, you can multiply how much it costs for the MRI, MRA, which is probably a lot more in the United States than where you may live. But cost of medicine, at least in the U.S., not sustainable. All right, that's what I have to say about third nerve palsies. Um, I'm going to move on to our last topic, and, and hopefully we'll have time for, for some questions. We will. What's new in vascular neuroimaging? So this is a little more esoteric, I think. Um, just my objectives for this section are that we will discuss the pros and cons of CT, CTA, MRI, MRA, describe at least two developments in neurovascular imaging that have changed clinical practice. At least where I live, it's changed clinical practice. I think these things are probably things you all know. The CT basically versus MRI. CT is usually fast. It's more readily available. Um, there's low susceptibility to motion. Of course, it's faster. It's not as claustrophobic. It's good for bone and calcification. Uh, it doesn't matter. Well, you'll see, you'll see artifacts from metal, but it's not contraindicated if you have metal. Uh, it's good for looking at blood. MRI is traditionally not as good at blood, although some of the new imaging sequences uh, which I'm going to mention, SWI, is also good for blood. Of course, CT involves radiation. There's none in MRI. Um, there's also iodinated contrast, uh, which uh, there are a percentage of people with allergies to this. Gadolinium or gadopentate is generally better tolerated. It's lower resolution in general than MRI, and it's not as good for acute ischemia, whereas in MRI, the DWI, diffusion weighted imaging, can detect acute ischemia in as little as just a few minutes of ischemia. And here's an example of this, a patient that was sent to me from the emergency room with visual changes and, and imbalance. And um, it, it occurred uh, shortly after waking up one morning, he went to the emergency room, they got the CT scan and said, oh, good news, it sounds like a stroke, but your CT is normal. Well, I saw him, he had a homonymous hemianopsia. This is, of course, a stroke in his cerebellum, which is causing the imbalance. And this was not seen acutely on CT scan. So somebody with an acute stroke uh, within 24 hours, the CT may well be normal. What about CTA versus MRA? Well, CTA, you have to have contrast. You can't do a CTA without contrast. MRA, um, the contrast makes it a bit better, but you don't need the contrast. So you can do an MRA without contrast Unless you're interested in the aortic arch or in carotid stenosis, you can find aneurysms and find vascular lesions without contrast on an MRA. It's probably not quite as good resolution as a good CTA. That's the data that I've shown here, highly specific and sensitive for small aneurysms. Here's one of the new uh, things that we're doing, perfusion CT or PCT. This is more sensitive than CT for ischemia. I just showed you how can, CT can be very insensitive for acute ischemia. Here's a CT scan in the bottom left. You can get to stop doing that. Bottom left looks pretty normal. The PCT, the blue area here, is showing areas that are not as well perfused if you compare to the other side. And here's the CTA, which shows lack of big blood vessels to this hemisphere. So the PCT, which is very fast, 
sorry, I keep hitting my mouse thing, I'll use this. The PCT is more sensitive. And one of the ways that we're using it is um, the person gets this very rapid CT scan. I mean, it takes just minutes literally to do the scan. They're having a stroke, they're in the emergency room. Here's the, um, the uh, core infarct, with it, which is in red. This is area that probably is not salvageable. But then here's the green, which is what you see on the PCT. You can see how the green area is much larger than the red. So all, if you subtract out the red, which is probably damaged, look at the green that may be damaged if you don't intervene with um, blood thinning. So there's all this brain that might be saved. So here you can see, all, even way up in these cuts, there is, or way down in this, sorry, down in this case, and up, there's areas that are not dead where the core infarct is. So all the green, if you subtract the red from the green, all that extra brain could potentially be saved. So th this can be, this is actually emailed or texted to the stroke specialist in the ER from radiology to determine how important it is to treat this patient. Another thing that we're using is MR vessel wall imaging. It helps differentiate vasculitis from atherosclerosis, from dissection and vasoconstriction. So aneurysm wall enhancement, AWE. A -W -E. Um, here's a patient with a lesion, uh, and in this case, an aneurysm, and that's obvious from the MRA, but in this case, there's some enhancement of the wall. And this has been shown, AWE, aneurysmal wall enhancement, has been shown to be a risk factor for rupture. So if you see AWE, with the contrast enhancement, uh, enhancement of the wall of the aneurysm, that is much more worrisome than if you do not. And these days, you know, we don't treat every aneurysm. Smaller aneurysms are followed and observed if they're asymptomatic. That's a whole nother webinar. And then here's a patient with vessel wall imaging. Here's their non-contrast CT. You can see the acute hemorrhage. That's where the MRI usually is not as good. Here's a 3D time of flight MRA showing uh, occlusion of the M2 segment right here. Here's a T1 MRI showing this blockage in the blood vessel, and here's post contrast. So it's actually enhancing, indicating that this is actually a young person with a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, and they had vasculitis. So this is vessel wall imaging. These are all you know, software programs. And then I mentioned this briefly about detecting blood. So here's a patient, they get their MRI, the DWI shows all of the white is um, acute ischemia. Now, you don't wanna anticoagulate this patient if there's bleeding, right? Because then they're risk for cerebral hemorrhage. Well, how do you tell if there's hemorrhage? Here's the SWI, susceptibility weighted imaging showing hemorrhage in the midst of the infarction. So if there, this was not present, you'd, you would anticoagulate or treat with uh, platelet inhibitors. But because of the hemorrhage, you don't treat because you know this, the data shows that if you treat this patient, they, their stroke could get much worse. There could be a, more bleeding um, and it's contraindicated. So SWI. So in summary for what's new, you must know the pros and cons of CT versus MRI, of course, just to get your, your, the best test. CT perfusion imaging has definitely improved our treatment for stroke. And MR vessel wall imaging is aiding in our, how we approach aneurysms and diagnose vasculitis and so on. All right, so that's what I have to say about those three topics. I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pull up the Q&A, which where I can see there are a short 43 questions apparently. Um, let's see if there are all questions. Um, there is a, there, there, I'm going to probably not answer questions that are not relevant to the topics we just discussed. There's one on managing third nerve aberrant regeneration. There's, you know, I send them to a business surgeon and see what they can do. There's no right way to do it, but I'm not gonna, not gonna try to answer those. Um, all right, let's, let me scroll through. Um, what is the management of third nerve palsy due to birth trauma? Um, with a normal delivery. Well, we didn't talk about kids, of course. I mean, I, the management would be, um, are you sure it's due to birth trauma? So I think that would require imaging in a newborn. Um, and then I would wait and hope that it gets better. 
Uh, and then, of course, the usual, you know, if it doesn't, if the lid is shut, you know, you've got to worry about amblyopia, strabismus, et cetera. Um, after the completion of this lecture, a certificate will be offered to the participants. I don't know the answer to that. Perhaps Orbis will let you know. Um, someone says, yes, you'll get a certificate. Um, can color vision be normal in inflammatory optic neuritis? So the answer is yes. I just had uh, one of my young attendings uh, present a patient to me and said, well, you know, the person's younger. I was thinking it was optic neuritis, but their color vision is normal. And um, I said, well, what is their acuity? 2020. I said, well, again, color vision should be affected in any optic nerve problem if the central vision is not normal. But if the central vision is normal and there's a peripheral field defect, the color vision can be normal and they can still have optic neuritis. Um, let's see. Oh, that's not related to this. <laughs> um, is does thyroid optic neuropathy have a relation, ah, a relation with T3, T4, TSH? And the answer is not, not that I'm aware of. It doesn't. And I, I always talk to patients about, and when I, I, tell, when I start telling them about thyroid eye disease, I say, I'm going to talk about thyroid eye disease and thyroid blood disease. And the two don't necessarily have anything to do with one another. So, of course, we want to fix your thyroid blood disease, but that may have no bearing on your thyroid eye disease. I certainly see people who, 10% of people have no thyroid blood disease ever. Um, so, and I see people who are hyperthyroid 20 years ago, had thyroidectomy, their blood level's great, they come in with acute onset of thyroid eye disease 20 years later. So it's related to the immune response, of course, not to the other markers. Uh, but why should we do a visual field when the vision is 10 of 10 and the fundus is normal? Because when, a, uh, when thyroid compresses your optic nerve in the orbital apex, you don't necessarily get swelling. Uh, you should do that if there's a tumor, same thing. If there's a tumor compressing the optic nerve in the orbital apex, you can have normal color vision, you can have normal confrontational vision, you can have, definitely have a normal fundus, and you can have a significant optic neuropathy. And you want to make sure they don't get to the point where they've lost central vision and so on. Um, Many cases, we are unable to discern the cause of the isolated third nerve with negative imaging angiogram and blood work. Right. I mean, I think that, that the point is that probably if you can't, think, if, if the imaging, you have good imaging and the imaging is normal, it's probably microvascular. That's why in that one study where I showed 140 something patients, 43, it said presumed microvascular. Why presume? Well, because either they were the right age or, the, or the, all the studies were normal. So I don't know that you can say, normal imaging in any person with a third means it's microvascular. I think if the person is um, over 50 and they have normal vascular imaging, I'm going to probably assume it's microvascular. I'm going to follow them and watch for improvement. I didn't mention, but the vast majority of people with microvascular thirds get better. I mean, 99%, right? So if they don't get better over six to 12 weeks, that's going to make me nervous and I'm going to have to look harder make sure they're, that they're imaging, they had good imaging of their brain with contrast. Um, in a younger person, clearly I want, and not just, the, not just the A, not just the angio, but I wanna look at the tissue um, for things that might not kill you today, like an aneurysm, but I want, I, I want dye. I never order an MRI of the brain without dye, never. Um, how do you clinically differentiate muscle enlargement to do thyroid disease from other etiologies such as oral lymphoma or IgG4 disease? So that can be difficult because I don't necessarily believe all the stuff about tendon sparing, et cetera. I think, you know, if it, obviously, if the person has other findings of thyroid eye disease externally, lid retraction and so on, and they have the typical pattern of extraocular muscle involvement, medial or inferior than medial, I'm going to assume that it's thyroid eye disease if there's something, anything atypical about it. There's no external signs of thyroid disease, lid retraction and so on. Um, if there's um, uh, um, weakness of the muscle as opposed to restriction, right? So remember thyroid eye disease causes double vision by restricting movement, not by paralyzing as lymphoma might or IgG4, uh, that would be a clue. If it doesn't fit the pattern, there's just a big superior rectus or there's just a big lateral rectus, there's probably going to get the stu blood studies and probably biopsy of the muscle. 
Um, just with, no, with abnormal visual fields and thyroid eye disease. Can we say it's a dysthyroid optic neuropathy even though there's no RAPD? Uh, no, I mean, I, it, should we not ask for CT? Yes. So I think if the visual fields are abnormal, of course, I'd want to make sure they're reproducible because I see, you know, the first time someone does a field, I see garbage all the time. So I'd, I'd like it to be reproducible. Um, if it's asymmetric, let's say there's terrible field on one side, normal on the other, and there's no APD, that would make no sense. I'd want to repeat that. Um, if I, and I'm going to get, certainly before I'm going to treat them for thyroid uh, optic neuropathy, I'm going to get a CT of their orbits. Um, or at least I'm going to get one at the same time. If they come in with an obvious thyroid optic neuropathy and crappy vision, I'm going to start the IV steroids. But I'm always going to get a CT because some of the patients may need orbital decompression and they're going to get, they, they need a CT to look anyway. But if there's any, any question at all, clearly they need a CT. I didn't mean to say I wouldn't get a CT. How often do you perform an MRI as steroid response uh, control? I think that means in the setting of um, thyroid eye disease, do we get an MRI to look at the change in my, um, never. I mean, I, I, I don't care what the MRI shows. I only care if the nerve's working better. I think that answers that. Um, could the visual field defect in thyroid eye disease caused by restriction of extraocular motility? Well, I don't think it can be caused by restriction of motility. I think, it, I think it's, it's either big muscles that are restricting motility, but causing compression in the orbital apex. I don't think, I mean, that's an interesting idea somehow. I don't, I, I have never, never heard or read of that. Can the VEP be of some help in early diagnosis? Probably referring to thyroid. Um, uh, I, I suppose it might. I mean, I think the other things are adequate. And for me, VEP can be, um, I see a lot of junk comes out of VEP that I can't explain well. So I'm not a big fan of VEP. I, I, I order a VEP maybe once every 20 years. Uh, just in general. I mean, I only, the only time I order pretty much if, if I think the patient has non-organic vision loss, almost. Sometimes if there's a question of old optic neuritis. What are laboratory examinations need to evaluate in dysthyroid optic neuropathy patients? Well, um, usually by the time someone is diagnosed with dysthyroid, of course, they, they don't develop, you know, dysthyroid optic neuropathy over a week. They have, they usually have already had the evaluation, at least where I'm from, maybe not, maybe not everywhere. But yeah, I mean, I'm going to check a, a thyroid stimulating hormone, a T3, T4, and a thyroid um, stimulating immunoglobulin. Um, would you do electrodiagnostic? So I think we just talked about that. The answer is I don't. Um, is dysthyroid optic, what are the signs of response? So improvement in the fields or the acuity or the color vision, and all of those things that you would measure, all the, the various uh, measurements of function of the optic nerve. Um, if the patient does not have optic neuropathy, until your restriction, can we still give IV steroids? So the answer is yes. Um, we didn't talk about just um, moderate thyroid eye disease, but there's a lot of data that shows that a once a week intravenous steroid, either um, usually it's either 500 milligrams methylprednisolone or a thousand milligrams once a week for six weeks. So I will often if the person has pretty active looking thyroid eye disease and double vision, uh, pain and irritation, I'll give them uh, once a week for six weeks and then repeat it sometimes. If, they're, if they've got a good response, but that seems to flare up, I'll repeat it another six weeks. Uh, why is rituximab contraindicated in desired optic neuropathy? Any mechanism which it worsens the neuropathy? I don't know the answer to that. I, I certainly have never used it, but I don't know. Um, what is your experience with, oh, intraorbital steroid injections for thyroid eye disease? I have none, although I know there are a paper or two, I think from, mostly from Latin America, um, that have, have advocated for that. I certainly don't think there's been any sort of, um, uh, clinical trial though, as best I know. Um, and so I have, I have zero experience with intraorbital steroid injections. Um, is there a serological biomarker for thyroid eye disease? Well, I mean, I think, you know, usually, usually there'll be signs of hyperthyroid or the blood, the, the blood test for hyperthyroidism will be abnormal. But again, if not, you look for euthyroid graves. I look for thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins primarily. 
why is there red desaturation? <laughs> Good question, but there, it, it, color vision is typically affected if central vision is. I don't know why exactly, that's an interesting question. What precautions do we take with methylprednisolone treatment? Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty safe. I, I don't, I don't, there are no, I mean, obviously if the person's diabetic, they would be the same problems. I mean, you know, I, we've given intravenous steroids for a long time for optic neuritis and the, the studies have shown very little bad side effects. I mean, the main side effects in those studies are sleep disturbance and um, mood swings, basically. A couple people got depressed, but I mean, we think in, generally otherwise healthy people, there aren't many. I think in a, you know, a frail little old lady, um, which I are not usually the people I treat, that you might want to admit them for the IV steroids. But most of the patients we treat as outpatients, they go in once a day for three days in the setting of dysthyroid optic neuropathy. Or if it's the, just the moderate thyroid eye disease, they go in once a week, they, they start an IV, they get their, their uh, dose and they go home. Um, it's a nice paper from uh, Drs. Freitag and Choi on why classic dysthyroid optic presents most commonly with an inferior visual acuity. Ah, do the superior muscle being closest to the optic nerve the analyst is in? Interesting. Thank you. That's from Orbit, um, 2017, uh, August edition, for those of you who want to read more about that. And I, 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 I'm not sure if that's proven or theory. Um, uh, but maybe that inferior rectus, which is the biggest, usually the biggest, is pushing it towards them. Uh, um, okay, but that makes sense. Um, what is the dose and regimen of steroid in your practice? Well, well, it's exactly what we talked about. So if, it's, if they come in and we say, you have a dysthyroid optic neuropathy, it's a gram of, of methylprednisolone um, a day for three days, um, and then followed by once a week. If, it does, if the person's not responding, um, meaning their vision is getting better, their visual field is getting better, et cetera, in two weeks, then orbital decompression. Um, there's a question about watching this conference. I believe these are all recorded and available on the CyberSight website um, in the very near future. Um, so just to confirm, if the age is more than 50 and a patient having diabetes, and, have, and even if it feels sparing, we must image. I mean, I, I, that's, what I, that's what I'm teaching. Um, I mean, I think if you see tons of third nerve palsies, but again, it's got to be age more than 50, patient is diabetic, hypertension, it's acute, you know, this is going on for a week. Um, I woke up, my lid was shut, or my lid shut, not, this is gradually getting worse. And it's got to be isolated, right? No fourth nerve palsy, no fifth nerve palsy, no other symptoms. Um, you know, that's when, I, that's when I don't image but I know what to look for. I know the questions to ask to determine if it's isolated. And I see a lot of third nerve palsy. I think everyone else who sees the occasional third nerve palsy, it's way safer to just image. Um, what is the schedule for tapering and systemic steroids to prevent recurrence? So that would be recurrence of thyroid optic neuropathy. Um, the, the, so what I do is what we just mentioned, which is if, it's, if they have dysthyroid optic neuropathy, they get the three days, a gram a day, methylprednisolone every day. Then they get once a week. And as long as they're improving, they get once a week for the six more weeks. And that's the taper. What is SWI? So susceptibility weighted imaging is just a, uh, it's a software computer program that allows um, the MRI to detect blood, acute blood, in the setting of a, an ischemic stroke. So the problem is, if you have an ischemic stroke, sometimes there's bleeding within the stroke. And if you have bleeding, you don't want to treat with antiplatelet agents because studies show that you, you, it's worse. You can cause that hemorrhage to increase and uh, kill the patient, maybe, or make their stroke worse. So the SWI specifically will show you in that stroke that's shown by the DWI if there's blood. Is there any role in systemic steroids in isolated third nerve palsy of microvascular cause? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> uh, some comments I won't read out loud here. They were good. Um, I love you too. Uh, let's see, can we only do MRI rather than going for MRA? Um, as that is interventional. Well, I'm not sure what you mean. MRA is not interventional. Um, 
in, if you were talking about third nerve palsy, what is the thing we're really, really worried about? An aneurysm. Will an MRI show you that? Probably not. Certainly not as well as an MRA or a CTA. And it's not interventional in the sense that um, you can do an MRI, an MRA or an MRI without contrast. You cannot do a CTA without contrast. So if by interventional, you mean an, an intravenous injection, then an MRA does not have to be done with dye. Um, you can do it without. Um, in which cases are you recommending radiation? Well, that's interesting because, you know, that article about radiation is, um, I have not recommended radiation uh, recently. And I don't think I've had many dysthyroid optic neuropathies in the last year or so, but it does, that one study does give you pause. I mean, um, I think radiation might be certainly in, in an older patient, anybody at risk for oral decompression. But again, if they're failing the steroids, Right now, I recommend orbital decompression. If the person says to me, and they do, I won't have surgery, I'm 80 years old, I don't want the risk of surgery, then I say, all right, we've got radiation. But I guess that's the way I'm using it right now. I don't think I've switched to the radiation. But there may be data, I'm hoping there's data that comes out that changes that approach for me. Who's to decide the special forms of imaging? Yeah, well, that's tough. I mean, these are new things. And so I think what I would do is, is make sure that, as usual, make sure the radiologist knows, what are you looking for? Um, I, this patient presented acutely. I think they might have a stroke. I'm looking for a stroke. I'm also looking to see if there's blood, you know, associated with it. And then they'll recommend it. Um, so I think the radiologist almost always are going to probably know more than the ophthalmologist about what to, what to get. How to learn interpreting neuroimaging as ophthalmologist? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things you might want to learn. There's certainly, I think there are textbooks written on um, neuroimaging for ophthalmology. Uh, I think there is, uh, I think I gave a webinar on that that should be recorded and on CyberSight uh, website. That would be a start, I suppose. How to decide an old optic dispaler is due to resolve dysthyroid optic neuropathy if someone has history? Well, as I tell all my patients, and I see lots of patients that are sent to me with optic atrophy, right? They have a pale disc, they have an APD if it's unilateral. I tell them all the same thing. When I look at your pale disc, it's kind of like if you're driving home today and you see a car that's at a telephone pole. You can say that, well, there's been damage, there's an accident there, but you can't tell me if that car uh, got run off the road by another car, if the driver fell asleep, if the driver hit a patch of oil you can't look at optic atrophy and say, I know what caused this. And so you've got to investigate for the various causes of optic atrophy. We published a paper years ago now. We looked at 90, I think it was 95 or 97 patients with unexplained optic atrophy. They all got MRIs. A quarter of them had tumors that were previously not diagnosed. So we image all patients with optic atrophy if it's unexplained. What is the management of ischemic third nerve palsy? Um, if you're convinced that it's ischemic, um, I, if the, I ask the patient, have you had a general physical examination with your intern, your family doctor in the last six months? If you haven't, you need a tune-up. Go get blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes checked. If you have and you're doing well, I'll see you in six weeks to make sure your microvascular third nerve palsy is getting better. Um, as long as it's improving, we'll maybe see you in six more weeks, make sure it gets better all the way. Um, partial versus complete third, significance. Well, I mean, it is significant. Again, if I see, I, I said that, what do I do? And maybe it's different than what I teach. Um, if I see a 70-year-old who comes in and says, yeah, you know, a day yesterday I woke up, my lid was droopy, by the end of the day it was closed, he comes in, he's got a complete third with pupil sparing. Okay, complete third, pupil sparing over 24 hours. I'm not imaging that person. I wouldn't fault anyone for doing it who's not a neuropathologist. I wouldn't fault them, but I'm not going to do it. On the other hand, let's say they come in and they've got a partial third nerve palsy and it's been going on for a couple of days. Maybe that aneurysm hasn't pushed on that pupil fibers yet. It should, theoretically, but maybe it hasn't. So either if I'm convinced it's going to be ischemic, I'm going to say come back in a few days because I want, I want to see that that lid shuts and your pupil's not involved. And that's part of the problem. A partial third nerve palsy with pupil sparing may just be because the, whatever's causing it hasn't affected those pupil fibers yet. 
any role of OCT in the diagnosis of optic neuropathy? Sure. I mean, I, I think OCT can help. Remember, acutely, there, it won't, um, unless you're not sure if there's swelling of the nerve or not. But let's say it's a retrobulbar optic neuropathy like thyroid, and it's relatively new, then OCD won't help because you, you hopefully haven't damaged any of your nerve fibers and you'll have a normal OCT. So if, that said, if there's damage and you lost nerve fibers, it can help tell you that there's the problems at the nerve. Um, uh, let's see, good morning. In, in, in uh, dysthyroid optic neuropathy, what if the patient has systemic disease that makes steroids not the best choice? Yeah. So that would be if the let's say the person just can't the steroids are going to kill this person because they've got diabetes. Well, then I would definitely go right to um, orbital decompression. And if they were so fragile that that wouldn't work, I would go to radiation. Um, what's the management congenital third nerve palsy? They're probably all at least in the United States. They're all going to get imaged, and then it's going to be uh, I'd send them to the pediatric ophthalmologist and say what what can we do to try to rehabilitate the eye. Um, I think I answered the protocol for dysthyroid optic neuropathy. Does the risk of dysthyroid optic neuropathy related to clinical activity score? Yes, I think it does. I mean, I, you, as I tell patients, you're not going to have a normal looking eye with no motility problems um, and have a dysthyroid. I mean, that would be very rare. In fact, we just had a patient who um, came in with acute loss of vision, big APD, NLP, big extraocular muscles, history of thyroid eye disease, <laughs> big muscles, no lid retraction, um, acute loss of vision. She had sarcoidosis, biopsy proven sarcoidosis. Um, so I think the clinical activity score, yes, that's important. Uh, place of oral corticosteroids. I think if you can't give intravenous, you can give oral. You can even be, give big dose oral, but in general, things have trended towards the best treatment being the pulse steroids, intravenous. MRA, DSA, when it will be the first investigation? I mean, I never do just, you know, a, a, a catheter uh, cerebral angiogram as a first step because MRA and CTA are really good. I said I would get a, a, a cerebral angiogram only if an MRA or CTA were normal and I was really concerned about an aneurysm. How, when is the last time I had to do that? I can't even remember, more than a decade ago. But if you don't have good MRA, CTA, then you would get the angiogram sooner than I would. Do other acute isolated cranial nerve palsies, four or six, have unique etiologies as isolated third? So you're not as worried about aneurysms because of the anatomy, that, that, that posterior communicating artery aneurysm is right next to the third. That's why aneurysms, it's just where aneurysms like to form. So you're certainly not anywhere near as worried about a critical, acute, you know, intracranial hemorrhage with a fourth or a sixth. So fourths and sixths are different in that respect. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they have unique etiology. I mean, I don't know about unique, but they certainly fourth and sixth microvascular are still probably the most common. Certainly microvascular six is the most common six nerve palsy I see. Uh, microvascular forests are pretty common, but they can be seen, of course, after trauma, most commonly, um, and they can be congenital with breakdown later on in life. All right, we're running out of time here. I'm not going to get, there's still 129 open questions. Um, I'll go for one more minute. Um, for suspected vascular problems, CTA or MRA, which is better? Um, it really depends, I think, on your institution. I would ask your neuroradiologist, if you have one, which, which do you prefer? Which do you think is more sensitive? Um, the studies show that good CTA is a little more sensitive than good MRA. Can a mild thyroiditis present with dysthyroid? Well, sort of by definition, it's not mild, but the answer is no. I, I really would expect them to have significant obvious thyroid eye disease. Um, you say suspicion of aneurysm and partial third if normal MRI, what are the points of, it, of CTA? Well, I think that depends. I mean, if your radiologists say that, hey, the MRA is normal, but the CTA is better, let's get one. I'd get one. But if I'd, I'd get whatever the best non-invasive study is first. And then um, I don't think in my setting, I'd get, if I got a normal MRA, I don't think I'd get a CTA. I'd get the angiogram. Because again, there is an issue of timing too. We want to find the aneurysm and fix it. Um, 
Do you do thyroid antibody tests in cases of euthyroid cases? Yes. Um, in cases of third palsy with, will I move and exercise help? No. Um, how do we manage dysthyroid optic neuropathy stretch? So that's a good question. There's certainly no, no one's ever really looked at it because there's not enough cases, but probably it would be orbital decompression. Maybe, you know, I didn't mention fat. Sometimes people will remove fat from orbits, not usually so much for thyroid optic neuropathy, but for exophthalmus, you could consider those. I'm not sure about the prognosis, honestly. I, I literally have seen less than a handful of cases uh, in my career. Um, do you use navigation to optimize outcome of oral decompression? I don't do oral decompression. I send them to my oculoplastic people, so I'm not sure exactly how they're doing it. Sorry. Um, is sixth nerve palsy association with, with other nerves like third and fourth? Sure, I mean, cavernous sinus lesions, right? Third, fourth, and six, and five. V1, V2, we should be looking for that combination. Um, answered that one. Who will, what will you manage the pupil sparing third nerve palsy patient who's less than 50 and has, yeah, I image them. If they're less than 50, I don't care if they, you know, if they have diabetes or not. I've definitely seen microvascular cranial uh, third nerve palsies in juvenile diabetics. You know, they're 50 or they're 45, but they've had diabetes for 30 years. So you can see it. I still image them. Uh, that's, let's see. All right. I think we're running out of time here. So it's 1116, my time. Um, thanks. I'm sorry. I couldn't answer all the questions. There's still now 133 open questions. Maybe we should have a webinar of just questions. Um, uh, but I thank everybody for, um, participating. And uh, again, this will be, uh, this has been recorded. It will be available on CyberSite. Um, so I appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, good luck uh, with your neuro-ophthalmology. Hopefully, hopefully I've helped at least with a few conditions, a little bit. Um, and if you want to look at old CyberSight webinars that I've done, and I've done a bunch, uh, they should all be recorded. Thank you.